my on my iPad it says it's four o'clock and Bob Rock assured me that if I did not start on time, he would punish me. So I'm just make sure I don't get punished. Good evening. To order, and I will do what Connie tells me every time, otherwise she'll hit me. <laughs> Ms. Garcia, would you do the roll call, please? Oh, now you want it. That's why I wanted you to turn it on. Eva Henry, Steve Odoricio, Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. Here. David Beacom. Here. Randy Wheelock. Sean Wood. Chrissy Panganello. Anthony Graves. Present. Robin Kniech. Kevin Flynn. Roger Partridge. Here. Gail Watson. Libby Zabo. Casey Ty. Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Rini Peterson. Larry Vidham. David Spellman. Aaron Brockett. Matt Applebaum. Ann Justin. Lynn Baca. Rex Bell. Tara Radloff. Jeff Blue. George Teal. Yes, ma'am. Doris Trular. Carrie Penaloza. Laura Crispin. Earl Holan. Richard Champion. Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Steve Yates, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Present. Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Henry Ergot. Here. Lynette, is that you? Okay. Scott Norquist, Storm Glore. Sosha Karis Graves, Casey Brown, Ron Rakowski, Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Stephanie Walton, Shakti, Here. Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Phil Cernanek, Present. Jacob, <laughs> Jacob Lofgren, Larry Strock, Wynn Shaw, Present. Joan Peck, Gabe Santos, Ashley Stolzman, Connie Sullivan, Dan Greenberg, Colleen Whitlow, Joyce Palazuski, Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Kyle Mullica, John Dyack, Sally Daigle, Gary Howard, Rita Dozal, Heidi Williams, Eric Montoya, Herb Atchison, Joyce J, Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Bill Van Meter. Okay. Okay, we're off and running. First item up on the agenda is the summary of the board work session. This is attachment A in your package. Is there any comments, corrections, or questions on attachment A? Seeing none. Okay, we'll move on. Accepted. Next item on the agenda, item four, public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held. Before the Board of Directors, each person will be allotted up to three minutes. Is there anyone in the audience who has a public comment they'd like to make? Seeing none, we'll move on. Steve Oricio has been joining us now. First item up Aaron on Brockett. the uh, item five, discussion of the focus areas for the draft 2020-2023 TIP, Mr. Rex and company. Thank you, sir, very much, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I would uh, just one public service announcement. Well, first on, I think we, I, think, I hope everybody agrees that we had a, a pretty good board works, workshop a couple weeks ago, and getting a thumbs up from uh, Arapahoe County, so that's good. It was it was great, not pretty good. <laughs> well, I like that I like that terminology better. Let's go with great. Um, and I would ask you, if you have not uh, filled out the survey, that the, the post-event survey that Jerry sent out or Connie sent out, please do so. We got pretty good response, but we'd like to have the last few if possible, so that would be fantastic. And um, really, in the comments area, you know, if there's anything that you want, we're always looking to improve it, so if there are ways, don't be shy about sharing um, any comments you have about ways to improve. Yeah, I thought your purchase of the third round of drinks was a bit much. <laughs> Thank you. I think. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah. So one of the one of the plenary events on Saturday uh, had to do with the uh, tip focus areas, 
And, um, and you know, what we did as part of that, and you'll recall the whole focus areas, and this came out of, um, you know, a couple of the white papers that, that the TIP Policy Work Group did for you all. And what we hope to accomplish with that, with the, with the recommendation for you guys to develop some focus areas is, um, you know, that you, quite frankly, give a, have, a, have a careful um, uh, discussion and consideration of, uh, of what you would like to do with the monies we have available in the next TIP. Um, to make life better in this region. So, so what we did, we went through an exercise at the board workshop for those that were not present called paired comparison. And basically what that is, and Jerry's in the back of the room, he can talk about it for hours if you like, but it basically compared each of the proposed focus areas against one another. So you compare the first one against the second, first one against the third, and then you come wrap it back around and you compare second against the third, second against the fourth, and you get the idea. And what this, you know, what the, the hope is through this exercise is that we begin to prioritize those focus areas. So what we did, we provided the, uh, the board workshop participants with a list of nine potential focus areas which, uh, which um, uh, you know, for your consideration as part of this discussion. And at the, at the board workshop, we did ask if there were additional um, uh, focus areas you would like to have for consideration in, in this exercise, and there one w was one that was added. The, the nine that we provided to you all are included in your attachment in the work, work session agenda tonight. And the fifth, the, the tenth one that was added was enhanced long-term mobility while reducing vehicle miles traveled. So there was ten in total that were used as part of this matrices and part of this exercise. And at the end, when all was said and done, um, well, before I say that, I just want to point out that all ten of these, and I made a point of mentioning this, and I think everybody, uh, there was a lot of head nods during the workshop, that all ten are important. It's not that any of them were less, any less important or not, but what, what is it the board would like to concentrate on over the four years of this next tip to help, uh, you know, try to focus your attention to? So when it was all said and done, the recommendation out of the, uh, out of the uh, board workshop were the three that are noted in your, um, within your agenda packet. And those were uh, to improve mobility infrastructure and services for vulnerable populations, increase reliability of existing multimodal transportation network, and improve transportation safety and security. Those were the three. Um, and at this point in time, before we get into the next steps for the day, I would have liked to ask if there were any, any comments, discussion, those that were present at the workshop or those that were not that had some questions of those that were present um, about the uh, selection of those. Um, uh, one question is sort of what happens with them now and do the, how much more detailed do they become? Um, and then uh, in the future, I, um, I wonder if it makes sense to have sort of a more of a conversation about each of the things we're voting on before the vote, just because I think it can really matter if you've sort of flushed out exactly what you're talking about before you have the vote. Um, and uh, and I think that the, the having the specificity is important, so I hope we're going there in, in the future. Now, now your, your comment on, on the voting, were you referring to the actual, during the exercise? Like, so, it, I mean, it, it was helpful that the, you had the paper come out that listed each the thing and, the, and a yeah. description. But, um, so I'm really happy that um, the Transportation for Vulnerable Populations ranked really high. I think that's great. I also noticed that we had just had a presentation on it and seen a video. Um, and I, I think that um, there were some important, it would have been interesting to see if we'd had a little bit of flushing out of all those other subjects and then voted. Um, I also felt a little bit uncomfortable that there was this time issue. We were coming up with criteria, but it was like Saturday afternoon, and there was a time issue, and um, it felt like a fast way to deal with something really important. Um, that said, I don't. Uh, there were good things about it too. <laughs> no, I appreciate your comments. No, you are right. I mean, there there are time restrictions, obviously, in a workshop like that. We had three items, of course, and. And, uh, you know, I mean, it really was, it, it, it's, it's to initiate that discussion, right? We want to try to pare, begin to pare down those focus areas um, for a more broader discussion amongst you all today and then ultimately, you know, at a, at, a, at a board meeting. 
So, no, I appreciate the comments, and I, I fully get it. Yeah. Other comments or questions? I don't get a lot of feedback from my city on Dr. Cog events, but I got a negative one on this one. The question was rhetorical. Isn't VMT important to Dr. Cog? And I said, yes, very important. Then why did you hold your meeting in Colorado Springs? <laughs> there were carpools, or truck pulls, as Mr. Atchison. But in any case, it was a lot of mileage added up any way you slice it. Yeah, and of course that that predates me. Then you know, and us, but I think it was it was one of those events. You know, I don't know how long ago, Connie, we started doing it off-site, but it was an opportunity for the board just to get away. And it doesn't mean we don't have to do it. And that's one of the questions we actually asked in the survey is what, if you, if you think there's merit or value in, um, you know, getting outside the region off-site and doing something. But that is not a prerequisite to this, uh, and to this deal. Uh, my comments would be equally applicable if we'd gone to Loveland oh, sure. or anywhere else. Yeah. Other comments? Mr. Cernani. I just, uh, Doug, in taking a look at the, the focus areas that we have, uh, I know you boiled them down to very short pieces, which were the titles for each of these. Sure. But uh, I think um, once it gets to the board, it, having those paragraphs, uh, because uh, I think that first item to me uh, also includes uh, some aspects of dealing with the first and last half mile. Uh, for the, that vulnerable population, uh, and uh, I think that's that's been that first and last mile has been the the nut trying to crack uh, that uh, is there, as well as the reliability has uh, a, a nice paragraph that explains what that is, and so it wasn't just um, these quick phrases, but there was also additional pieces that at least went into my considerations uh, at the workshop. Right, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Brockett. Yeah, thanks, uh, Director Cernanek, for that. And then I, what I would hope is that as we move it towards the board discussion that we'd get uh, more finely grained detail of the kinds of projects that these focus areas might support. So I think some specific examples would help um, our discussion when we make a final decision on the focus areas. Yep, we could do that. Thanks. Other comments? Well, I know that Elise and myself have been to four of these, probably. And I would tell you that, uh, and kind of in response to what uh, Mr. Rakowski was talking about, is we get people to get more focused by not being at home. We don't have people driving over for an hour or two and deciding they got to run over and open up the garage door for the handyman to come in or whatever. And I understand he's absolutely right. It is vehicle miles travel, but for the, as much as what we're trying to do in that one event. Otherwise, we're at the same place every meeting we have downtown to get out of here and get people focused and stay focused and not be going back and forth, I think more than warrants answering the concern that anybody would have of, well, if you're concerned about vehicle miles travel, why don't you go? It's very common for boards to get away from their normal workplace so that they are focused and not distracted by what's going on. That's two cents. Ms. Jones? I would agree with uh, the chair that it is helpful for us to go away off-site. It, it, I think in part because we also get a lot, I think, out of the social time that we spend in the evening together. And if we all went home and came back in the next morning, we wouldn't spend that. And it's important for relationship building. And I know how important that is for Mr. Dyack from Parker, because we just discussed how collaborative we're getting. Um, and it helps to uh, lubricate the collaboration, I guess. But um, I, I, but I, I think that the, the mayor um, has a good point about whether or not it's possible to uh, actually hold these retreats and have lower VMT. And I would politely suggest a group bus or van pool, because we know that Dr. Cog's really good at that. We could all travel together, further collaborate. Party bus. <laughs> Party bus. <laughs> Just saying, but I but in and I'm only being somewhat glib in suggesting that. I would also say that I thought it was a really good retreat. I think that uh, we had pretty good attendance, and I think part of that was because we were discussing the tip. But I'll take it. Yeah. Um, I think the last two retreats in particular were were 
very well thought out, and I I think P and E gets some credit for that, um, for for helping shape the agenda. So, kudos. And Thank and you. our numbers were up again over the previous year. Yep. So, and that's always helpful. Gone, actually, and some people brought their alternates, which was also good to do. Yep. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. yeah. Any other comments or questions on the article before us? That's the first part. Okay. <laughs> okay, so there's no more comments or questions on the uh, actual uh, proposed focus areas. The next step is to have a discussion today. Just to, I mean, we threw a few questions out there just, just for your consideration. Um, in helping uh, staff as well as the TIP policy work group develop you know, project evaluation criteria and the like, we would like to get your thoughts and some discussion on you know, how these focus areas should now be used now that we have them. What should they be? Should they be, as the first question suggests, a litmus test to, um, to project eligibility? Um, or, should they, or, the, or should focus areas be used more as a guide for investment decisions? Um, and if they are to be used as a litmus, litmus test, how many of those m must a project comply with? All three, two, one, whatever that might be. We'd like to have some, you know, some, some discussion about that. And the other, other two questions, one relates to, you know, and that evidence in support of those focus areas from those, from those um, uh, proposed projects, you know, how should they address those focus areas? Should it be you know, more quantitative in nature you know, by the numbers, or should there be an opportunity to, you know, to, to allow some opportunity there for a narrative or to be able to show more qualitative benefits and uh, relationship to the focus areas? And then last but not least, should the focus areas be different, or the, or the utilization of the focus areas be different for regional share projects versus sub-regional share projects. And um, Mr. Chairman, I'll just, I'll just leave it out there lingering like that to see if we... Uh, did you leave uh, enough questions on the table? Yeah, I did. I believe I did. Yeah. Mr. Partridge, <laughs> any thoughts? What? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's the first person I looked at that wasn't looking at me. Well, do we want to start with the first one? Start, I mean, should it be a litmus test of some capacity, or, or should it just be used as a guide? Mr. Sinanik? Uh, I'll, I'll start off and jump on this one. Um, as we discussed somewhat at the workshop, uh, is we need to be taking a look at the portfolio of projects that are there. And uh, if you uh, have a portfolio of projects that doesn't address any of these, um, but you may have a project that might be small and to the side that might be um, something that will uh, address a, something that's important uh, that someone wants to grab onto that's out of Metro Vision. Um, I wouldn't necessarily disqualify that if overall the portfolio, whether it's the regional portfolio or the sub-regional portfolio, does take a look and really gives these some gravitas that's there. Uh, and I, as I said before, part of my understanding to some of these is there's actually multiple items that get addressed with some of these focus areas uh, and how that uh, works. In the end, though, we need to have quantitative measures that we're going to hold ourselves to in that performance. And um, I'm looking for the tech, um, tech yes. to... Uh, at least be in some position to say uh, how do we vet these on that criteria of actually having return on investment or a quantitative such that the portfolio aggregates to something that is actually meaningful if not optimal uh, in taking a look at the limited dollars uh, that would that we do have and um, I'm at least at the moment of a mind that uh, the regional and sub-regional should be measured uh, on the same uh, and that um, with that same criteria that I just mentioned. So, yeah. Shakti? In terms of the return on investment conversation we had before, um, will that just be these criteria or, I mean, like, will it answer questions like how well does this move people for the dollars spent? <laughs> like. I mean, will we get that kind of information as part of the return on investment? It's Brad here. 
Brad's, Brad's in the back of the room. I don't know, if Brad, if you want to say anything to this. But, you know, I, I think, Shakti, one of the things we're, we're finding out and some of the work we're, we're looking at with regards to the return on investment is, um, you know, kind of the sensitivity of a project, right? Um, because of the sheer size of the region, you know, how much will one, one project move the needle? And what we're finding, not much you know, with regards to some of the measurements or metrics that we might use. But as Phil suggested, you know, excuse me, Director Sinanik mentioned. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, that, um, you know, I think if we look at, you know, like a package of projects, for example, like at the sub-regional level, you know, once that packaged or portfolio of projects is presented, we might be able to show a, um, we, we'd have, more confidence in that return on investment of the package versus individual projects. Although there are certain metrics that, you know, that might, might be sensitive enough that we can show you. But I think that's the main thing we're really struggling with now is to provide what level that we can really provide you with some confidence. Um, Brad, did I mistake that? Please give me a thumbs up, so I must have done something right. I got you, Lisa. Go ahead. Um, it seems like just the number of people being moved, the amount it costs, the air quality impact, the, I mean, there'd be like measurements from that project that, right. that wouldn't be, it wouldn't be playing off bi big aggregate factors that you need a regional thing to look at. So. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, and there might be, I mean, we might be overthinking this too in some respects, right? There could be some more simplistic measures such as that, but we can just lay them out on the table. And compare, yeah. yeah. So you're out right, Mr. Pfeiffer. So the question is still number one, right? We're still on that question. Yes, sir. There. Um, so, so my staff uh, responded to this and felt that obviously the first thing out of their mouth was there's too many focus areas, which I don't think we've seen the narrowed down version of that yet, right? Well, this is this is what's this proposed. It? These these three, these three areas. Where, where, I'm sorry. So it's the improved mobility? Yeah. Yeah, the one on the first page. There, okay. On the first page. All right, sorry. Because they were looking back at the, uh, the, the, uh, the, whole the list. big list. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that kind of got them all freaked yeah. out a little bit. But, but uh, the, so, you know, they, I think they look at, our staff would like to see it as more of a limit test and also more focus so that they could respond and put their, our resources directly onto those focus areas. So. I think we take a little bit different stance, maybe than some, but that, if you're asking us to answer that question, um, that would be our direct answer back. And then also, um, I think it kind of answers the second part of that question, but I want to make sure we stay on track on that. Ms. Jones. So um, I'm going to get us off track and answer all of them. Um, I don't think it should be a litmus test. I think. If you are comparing two projects and one meets a focus area and one doesn't, then the one that does would get um, elevated status, right? Um, and I, I view these focus areas similarly to how we did the last tip cycle where we talked about first and final connections and um, uh, regional equity. So we just, it, it was higher up in our mind. I say that assuming that we will have pretty um, clear quantitative criteria and maybe some qualitative as well mm -hmm. guiding all projects. I think one of the, the good things that we did in the last tip was we said every project has to have some merit. We didn't go below I think a score of 50. Like we, we weren't going to fund projects that weren't, weren't going to give us much bang for our buck. And in the world that, that I think a lot of us live in um, we're getting more and more data driven. We're more guided by metrics and by outcomes. And certainly that's the direction in the federal transportation um, rules that they want to see more uh, on what we're getting for our limited dollars. And so I think it's really incumbent upon us, and I'll, I'll agree with direct Director Shenanik, we, we do need to be having some strong metrics and they should be measurable and we should be able to, as Director Shockby pointed out, be able to, to measure some of those on a project level so that we can, with confidence, at both the sub-regional and regional level, say every project in here is worth funding and it will add up to something that's related to the goals that we've outlined in Metro Vision and the goals that we have for our local communities. And I think it's important that we can say that about both regional and sub-regional. Ms. Shaw. 
Thank you. I really agree with what you said, Director Jones. I believe this should not be a litmus test. I would like to see it as a, a guide. Um, but with that said, certainly knowing that these are our focus areas, it would be most desirable to submit projects that focus on these areas. That's, that's really, I think, what, uh, what I see as the goal. Um, I would suggest that the projects come with some suggested qualitative and quantitative measures um, by which uh, not only the, the board can determine and choose, but I would also like to see um, us go back afterwards and see how they did with respect to their projections. Um, very much like the, uh, uh, the traffic um, flow work that was done with City of Lone Tree Centennial uh, oh, yeah, and traffic Dr. Operate. Cog. Yeah, right. right. I mean, what a fabulous, we saved this number of minutes and this much you know, that means that much fuel and time and all of that. I just felt that that type of reporting out is meaningful, at least to me, and, and so I'd like to see more, more of that. So probably more quantitative than qualitative. Um, and I would also like to see these um, flow down to the, the uh, sub-regional share as well as the regional share, if, if at all possible. Right, thank you. Mr. Odoricio. Thank you. I, uh, when, when, when we discussed this earlier, we kind of talked, what is, the, what is the purpose of the focus areas to begin with? And I think I looked at it. The answer that I got was that we really provide a lot of our vision from the vision documents, right. and we kind of go down and drill down into a little bit more detail. And I think what this provided us was some, some high-level guidance and some kind of general values that we want to push for. But I think that what I'm seeing is it makes sense as more of a guiding uh, principles that we want to try to push as a group. Yet I think that when you get down to trying to make something either a litmus test or a, or a real detailed criterion, criteria as a group, um, you want to be careful because the whole purpose of what we're trying to do with the whole sub-region in this is to allow, you know, Boulder to function differently than maybe Douglas within their boundaries and, and be able to prioritize some of the things that they care about maybe a little bit different than what Douglas has for their needs. And I use these as examples just because um, they're sitting to my right and left. But I'm, <laughs> the point I'm making is that um, what, what I'm getting at is that, that I think these should be high-level um, value-based um, aspirational type values and that we don't allow it to be um, something that because it's, it's already confusing enough kind of where we how we're going to use these and I think we really need to allow the sub-regions the ability to have some flexibility uh, to work with our own jurisdictions uh, and address needs as they uh, as they are within those boundaries thank you Ms. Dolsman Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree completely with Director Jones's comments. Um, that made a lot of sense to me. I would just sort of like to emphasize a couple of points. Um, so I think as we hone in on the measurements, irrespective of whether they're regional or sub-regional measurements, I think there should be a minimum score for uh, consideration of projects similar to how it was last time. So there's flexibility within the different pools, but I think everybody should have to meet some kind of minimum standard to show that the projects are of importance to the region and I think people will submit projects that can accomplish that. Um, and further, I think it's important and I, I think this is a concept that hasn't been really talked about much yet, but I think it's important that the different funding streams are considered at the onset rather than at the tail end as they've been in the past. So I don't think it would be equitable or fair um, if one subregion, for example, had all of the CMAC funding. So I think CMAC projects should be submitted across all the different types. Um, so I think we should consider the metrics up front that would make sure that that happens so that one area isn't doing all the air quality improvements and one area isn't doing all the congestion mitigation or something like that, that there's a balance of projects across the pools of funding. Thanks. Just a general question. Is there any municipality or county that doesn't use some level of measurement criteria to make sure that what you're providing your citizens provides 
a value on some level on any project that you don't fund? I'm not aware of anybody that doesn't. So would we not want to apply some level of criteria to anything that we approve here that it has to be a value, not just a want, nice to have, but actually provides a value? And I think that's what I'm hearing from all of you in different, different tones. You want viable criteria. You want measurable criteria. And I think that's what we all do. We just may be doing it a little bit differently. But I think all of us are trying to strive for that because at the end of the day, we have to account for the money that we've authorized to be spent and to make sure it's done in a fair and equitable agreement and that it provides a value to the metro area. If it doesn't, then we shouldn't be doing it. Mr. Dyack, did you have a comment? I'm going to give you the chance, although I told you earlier I would. I, yeah, no, I, I, I'm going to break my own vow here. Personally, I think I think everybody has said it. Director Jones, Stoltzman, Director Shaw, Director uh, Derisio. I think I, I think that's absolutely correct. So um, I'll just continue to. Uh, did you say you agreed with me? Absolutely. I did. Could you say that louder? I agree with Boulder County. Director Jones. Mr. Rakowski. Reference the CMAC funds. Uh, I would say that in some sub-regional areas that are very pastoral, such as Douglas County in Director Partridge's district, versus some heavy industrial areas where maybe you'd want that uh, extra applied for CMAC because of the pollution that comes from that particular area. So I, I wouldn't say that spreading it totally out over all areas is necessarily the right thing to do. I would do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you pull up the three focus areas again? Just go back. I don't, I don't have any uh, reservations about not tying these things directly and quantifying them. Uh, no litmus test I think is necessary, I agree. But I am curious about how staff sort of communicates these values and what we're doing as a board to really motivate and incent our members to look after these values. I, you know, I think that it came out of the, the will of the body and we recognize that these things are important and where they make sense to slot them in our TIP projects, we're going to do that. But, you know, wherever we can kind of motivate, inspire, and then quantify, I think we absolutely should do that. Uh, I, I'm confident that these sorts of exercises happen over and over again throughout the history of Dr. Cog, uh, but these, you know, this is an area where we can really make an impact if we push one another, and I, I don't even know if I'm being very clear here, but I don't think we need a litmus test, but whatever we can do to communicate very clearly and try to motivate and inspire the staffs, the various jurisdictions around the table to take it seriously, I think we should. Thank you. Mr. Odoricio. I, I would agree. I, th I still think that these are aspirational values that we need to push. And one of the things that we talked about when people were uh, over that weekend, we were concerned. Some folks were concerned about having this the uh, two tiered with the region and sub regional um, distribution. And I remember it, it became clear to me that there's still going to be checks and balances along the way. And this board is still going to have the final say on the allocation. And I think that's important to note that we can still be holding each other, um, whether it's an actual quantitative uh, criteria or if it's just simply through the qualitative working together collaboratively, I agree that we have to be able to push these values. And I think one of the things that makes me feel comfortable is that it's still going to come back to this board as a whole. And that people in this board are going to be able to look at each other eyeball to eyeball and say, are you meeting the goals and objectives that we have established as a region? And I still think that that's going to be important. I also would like to see when you talk about whether it's going to be criteria, uh, um, you know, one of the things I found that I love about Dr. Cog is it's, it's real big in the whole graphs and here's the divisions and, you know, it, and as a guy who came from organizational consulting, I really like that. So what I would like to know is how are the criteria within some of the funding structures used? I mean, so sometimes the funding sources have criteria to begin with. Right, and, and that was also requirements. Th yeah. right, and so there, there's an element of protection in within the funding source as they are. Then there's an element of protection within our planning process and documents, and then we will have a final say as a board. How do we kind of see all those coming together? And, and for me, that was sufficient enough to provide this kind of uh, group accountability without having to create a, an additional level or additional layer of new check boxes. So maybe we could talk about how do all those different layers kind of function all together 
And then we could determine, is it really necessary to even add another layer? Because I would say it's not, but I mean, I, I still think it's important to talk about how all these pieces fit. Right, wow. Um, I, I think Maybe not fantastic. now, but I'm right. saying like, like, how does it functionally work? And this might be something that you send me to the intro to Dr. Cog <laughs> newbies, you know, group to talk about it. But you yeah. guys made me feel comfortable at that retreat because there's all these different layers of accountability and and, multi and functional focus, uh, group focus. Indeed. Yeah. No, I I think that's a fabulous comment. And and you are right. There are different levels that will kind of regulate the process on its own, right? I mean, first is foremost is is you all as being really protector and stuff how we spend that money. I mean, it's 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 on you to to make that determination on how this money is going to be spent and to ask those questions, you know, how does this relate back to our metro vision plan, our regional transportation? Those types of things. I mean, that is on you to do. And I don't think anybody's shy in the room about doing that. Now, with regards to the funding sources, that was other uh, a comment that was spot on. I mean, there are certain eligibility requirements for that money that will kind of self-regulate it, it well, will we'll self-regulate. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, I feel pretty comfortable that there will be enough oversight with these focus areas, with, um, uh, you know, the criteria that's developed for the regional, sub-regional projects, and ultimately that everything comes back through the board as a filter, um, that I feel pretty comfortable about the, about the model that we're, we're uh, recommending to you all. Mr. Baker, did I see your hand up? I thought I had him. Okay. Jock T. So I feel like there's been a conversation about sort of this idea of a minimal score kind of thing. And is, is that going to be part of the plan or how is that? If you so desire. But, but yes, I mean, I would suggest that, quite frankly, it kind of works itself out anyway in some respects because, you know, projects that don't score well are going to be down towards the end bottom of the list. It only becomes a, a discussion if you don't have enough projects, right? Um, but I think that there's, you know, the, the metrics that we will apply, the criteria we will use, um, if a project does not score well, then I, you know, I think you guys will see that very quickly and it will be discarded. So are you saying, based on these three broad categories, a scoring system will be created and all the projects will be scored on that? Well, this is certainly a milestone for us, right, for us, the TIP Policy work group and staff, in that we, you know, we were really waiting on developing criteria until such time that you guys decided on focus areas so then we can fit the criteria to hopefully address a lot of this stuff that's in here. You know, we were going to do a lot of, you know, there was some, even if you didn't choose, like safety, for example, as a focus area, we were, we were federally mandated to include criteria associated with that, okay. associated with, you know, mobility criteria. You know, so there will be some and scoring and it will be sometimes broader than these three but focused on this, basically. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Teeter. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I like the focused areas. I, we all have projects that we think uh, should be in the focused areas. Uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of data out there that will tell you where the most vulnerable focused areas are. Uh, for example, um, we were going to Colorado Springs last week or whenever it was. You know, once you got past Castle Rock, that was a two-lane highway that was backed up both directions, coming and going. Uh, coming through uh, even the Denver area, we have areas that's it's backed up uh, in the morning and in the evening, going home and going to work. And we have areas that's backed up all day long. Uh, we have intersections that um, may kill two or three people a year. We have railroad tracks that need flyovers that to help move the, uh, the population through the Denver area. These are all focus areas. And uh, I don't know why we can't use, let's say, the, stat, the, the stats from a CDOT or somebody else that's already got the same, they look into these kind of things, and we can all get, put them together. We can put Dr. Cog with the CSTAT, with the CDOT um, focus areas also, and see that isn't the ones that we want to try to work on to, to help move traffic. Mr. Partridge. I think you're down to the Ds now, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, certainly, uh, however we score anything is going into it is always important. Where the real scores matter is what happens afterwards. You don't get an, when you take a test, you know, well, well, I think I'm going to get an A on this test, and the test comes back, and it, that was not the score I got. <laughs> so, 
that's a difficult thing, no doubt, when you trying to gauge a project prior to it. The real way to do it is gauge it after it's done. I know that's not feasible in some respects, but I think we have to be very cautious we don't go too heavily on litmus tests because all good intentions may not prove out to be that way. That's where I think we to some degree you give sub-regionals the, the ability to work within their own region with each other. They know better. What do we push all the time? Local control. But what does that mean? It's very hard to, to uh, measure that, especially prior to a project being completed, and that's what all these are, prior completions. And if we really wanted to be fair, we would set the criteria and then go look at projects that have already been done. Well, the problem is we didn't know to a degree those projects, the scoring of those occurred way years before us were entirely a different group. So uh, all good intentions to how do we decide what's the best way? But sometimes I think we get caught in the weeds and much better when we give local control to the subregions. Okay, Mr. Brockett. So just going back to the question that Shakti was asking before, um, Doug, the, um, it seems like where we're headed is that there'll be a set of criteria for scoring projects, right? Some number of them. Yes. And then these focus areas would provide a focus for those criteria, right? They wouldn't determine the exact criteria. Correct. But they would provide a focus for, for you as you shape the criteria. Right. Is that a fair summary of I the direction so. you're heading? Yeah, it is. I think that sounds great. So thank you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Quite frankly, I'll be, I'll be honest, the, the three that were chosen, um, you know, we, we had already proposed and have discussions about criteria that would match any or all of these. So, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a long reach for us or a big reach for us to, to get there. Mr. Mullica. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Director Partridge made some great points, I, I believe. Um, a question I do have, though, is in regards to the scoring criteria, I understand that these three things will be a part of that, and it sounds like there will also be some, some other criteria involved. Um, a concern I would have, though, is how subjective some of that other material may become. Um, and I know that you spoke about uh, equity earlier, um, and especially, I think, when it comes down to location or region. Um, and if that's going to be included in any of this criteria or, or how that will be incorporated to ensure that that, that equity is spread around. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a tremendous question. I, you know, I think that's something that, you know, we're beginning to have conversations about in the TIP policy work group and how that might be handled with regards to. I think, you know, what we have, have what we are proposing is that there will be some universal criteria that will, will have to be used within each subregion. And then um, anything above and beyond that, um, you know, we, we, it, is our, it is our proposal that we would provide some flexibility then within the regions to make a determination on if they want to include additional criteria. And I'm not sure what that looks like. It's just more of a concept right now than anything. Um, you know, to provide that, that local flexibility and be able to address those local values a little more. But there, you know, but, but I, I want to make clear, and maybe we, I don't think we've been real clear, or I haven't been real clear about this in the past, is that, you know, it's, you know, the sub-regions will have to work within curbs in how they select projects. And that will be criteria that ultimately will be approved by you all before the sub-regions ever do it. But then, once that's done, they can include additional criteria that maybe, you know, maybe separates some projects from others, right, that, that they want to focus in on. Okay. Ms. Jones? I guess I, where I see the flexibility coming is in what those projects look like in meeting the criteria, not so much that one subregion has to meet, a, you know, a criteria around air quality and, and another subregion doesn't, but that they both have to meet the criteria, but the projects could look completely different in how they do that based on what their community needs. So is that an accurate statement that the flexibility is around the project or the criteria? I just don't know if we're there yet, Elise, to be honest. Um, I'm looking at TIP policy work group folks in the back of the room. I don't know if they want to hop up and add anything to this, but um, 
I mean, I would suggest, I mean, but you can't control the types of projects that are submitted. I guess you can control the types of projects you ultimately select um, what, or approve, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I would, I just don't know if I can answer that yet. <laughs> Looking at Mac, he's nodding. All right, Mr. Rex. What else do you want? Because um, I, you're this getting was, a lot of feedback, but I don't know that we're actually directly answering your question. Well, I mean, I, I would. Oh, Some of the staff's sure. going up this way. Brad's back there trying to hide behind the chair of old <laughs> so nobody can see him. <laughs> Mr. Teal. You going to summarize it for us? <laughs> yeah, to wrap it all up. <laughs> So, I mean, uh, you know, we, we keep talking about these focus areas, but we are having a difficult time, obviously, you know, deciding what are we going to do with them. I wonder if we can't take a lesson from Jerry's exercise he put us through um, in the dying days of MVIC when coming up with the Metro Vision and consider these, uh, consider grouping our hard criteria that we can qualify mathematically right. beneath these three focus areas. And just, on the, just for the ease of being able to do it, and I know that might just sound like a, um, an analysis, uh, a rational thing, is somebody saying? But it might just sound like an analysis tool for us in understanding the, the criteria. Just make sure they're grouped up so that when we're presented with those big spreadsheets that everybody who went through this uh, the last time, I think you guys remember um, those very large metric spreadsheets, well, just get our criteria up under these focus groups so that it's not really a litmus test. It's not really a form of the scoring, but it's merely a means of analysis for us uh, when we're looking at those to understand exactly how those criteria should be fitting under these focus areas. That's my suggestion. Um, and so I don't know if it makes your guys' job easier but uh, it would make my job easier. No, definitely so. No, I appreciate that. I think, Mr. Chairman, I, you know, with regards to, and I'll just summarize what at least I've heard, I think the majority felt that it should not be used as a litmus test, as more of a guide for our development of criteria and the like. Um, and uh, let me see here. And uh, as far as, you know, quantitative evidence where possible, uh, but I, I mean, also the opportunity for some quantitative or some narrative associated with, and maybe that's, you know, um, you know, it's, it's a narrative about, you know, how it dresses maybe the outcomes or certain objectives of MetroVision, those types of things, for example. But at least provide that opportunity to them. Um, the one I feel probably less confident about from what I heard today is whether they should be, um, the focus areas should be treated differently at the regional level versus the sub-regional. And I think I'm, th those that have addressed that have said that, the, I mean, I think it, it should be the same. Is that accurate assumption? From the heads that I'm seeing move, most of them are going up and down. Okay, not going great. Sideways. No, that that helps quite a bit. Some of them well, aren't moving at all. Think, Deep in thought, <laughs> Mr. Odoricio. I, I think what I was hoping that we were. I think what we're trying to say is, it, it's good to have those high level. I just think that you're going to have criteria that may make be a different at the sub region that we work on individually with our within our sub region may be different than what this board does for those bigger shared projects. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's where we need the flexibility to be able to do that at the sub-region. Mr. Brockett and then Mr. Sinani. Look, is, um, I guess I've been thinking about this a little bit different, uh, Director Odorisio, that, that, that I was thinking that we can hand off the um, the money to the sub-regional allocations, but with criteria that the board agrees on in advance. And then, look, you're saying that um, every sub-region can then shape projects in their own way to meet the needs of their own community, but with some, uh, but carrying those shared values of the Metro Vision down through criteria that the overall board sets. So I've been thinking about it more in that kind of way. I think you, I mean, Mr. you're kind of saying the same thing. Yeah. And I'm no? Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm going to say two things. So one is um, wanting to make sure when it does come back to the board and in a couple of weeks that the fuller paragraphs at a, at a minimum are included. Yes. Okay. Uh, not to lose that. 
And secondly, as the subregions come back to the board, it's going to be, does your portfolio meet the objectives? It's not going to be on the individual projects because there can be within a subregion discussion in my mind, um, there may be an exception, but that uh, indeed it's going to be more on the aspect of does that subregion's portfolio fit with the overall regional objectives? You know, one of the things that I think some of you may be aspiring to is, look, we have the regional criteria that will be common to everyone. We have the sub-regional criteria that will be a flow down from that that will be common to everyone. Right. Yeah. But can you go beyond that at the sub-regional level and add some additional criteria over and above what the requirement that's passed to you through Dr. Cog is because of some specifics or some difference in your, in your region that may not be the same as in another region? Right. I, think you can, I think you can decide that amongst yourselves sort of what uh, Steve was talking about is there's going to be some things that are going to be particular to your region that do not have an impact on others but it's just like you're passing on from home rule you can add on to what state law requires you just can't diminish it and I think that's the one thing we want to make sure is we don't diminish the criteria that is governing everyone at a sub-regional level you can add to it but don't take away from it well and and her, yep. just, just to add to that, thanks, Mr. Chair, uh, on this, is a subregion may find a better match mm -hmm. uh, to augment the grant uh, that is there because it may be a collaboration among that subregion entities uh, for that match. Don't disagree. I had a hand. I thought it was moving over here. If not, I'll come back to Mr. Odorizio. I, I guess what I'm looking at is we may have different vulnerable populations, and I think it's good to have a high level. I mean, some populate, some some organ, some regions are going to have more veterans. Some are going to have more folks with poverty issues. We may define poverty issues differently for vulnerability. We may, maybe for us it's below twenty thousand. Maybe for these guys it's below one hundred fifty thousand. I don't know. <laughs> but the the point I'm making is we also have different. You know, that's just Roger's neighborhood. Okay. Um, <laughs> You know, they, they, you have different forms of multimodal transportation. You know, Boulder might be, and Denver might be more built out, and so their multimodal may be focused more on bike and ped, whereas multimodal for us may include some other effect, uh, other pieces of a multimodal approach. And then you look at transportation and safety. Adams County is, uh, you know, very going to be very much based on logistics and shipping and that kind of thing, whereas maybe someone else further away or a different region may not have. So I'm saying we just want to make sure that that the high level uh, values make sense, even if we're using these as kind of guides. But really, at the end of the day, we are different regions, and we have to address these things. And, and that's the whole point of having the sub-region approach. Yep. Mr. Teal. Yeah, I'd really like to second what Mr. Odorisio said, just because um, I think that is the case. I think you get down to the sub-regional levels, you know, we do have different needs. Um, and so I, I think, you know, keep the criteria there by all means. Keep the, keep the yardstick the same from region to region, sub-region to sub-region for the whole region. But, yeah, allow the sub-regions that latitude to, um, to, to recognize where their needs may differ from the others. All right. I think we've had pretty good rounds. I think most everyone who's wanted to provide a comment has had that opportunity. Those who have chosen to stay silent have done it at their own volition. So let me try to wrap us up. This, no, you're not getting it. You're, you're. No. No, I'm going to come to you. Would you like to speak on behalf of Mr. Teal? Then I'll recognize him. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Yeah. Mr. Dyack. Did you, do you have a comment now? No, I think it's I think it's great discussion observation. Uh, I greatly appreciate uh, Director Odoricio's comments, and it's just it's uh, it was amazing just to see uh, watch him talk and see Jerry in the back 
nodding in agreement and <laughs> you know right on the nose so giving thumbs up yeah I truly appreciate your comments and I I think we're on the right path uh oh now you started it that was I, that, see I have this problem with doing exactly the opposite of what I'm thinking and uh, not really I just want to comment, when you look at these objectives, you've hit on every point that's very key. Every local community has a view of that objective because it's what they need. So the initiatives or projects you bring forward could be varied, but they still relate and support that overall objective or focus area, we call it, but it's written like an objective. So what you're talking about, I have to go back to Brian's comment in the TIP policy, work group he says these give us a lot of flexibility at the local level am I accurate in that and it's true Gene and I had a similar conversation yesterday so you're on the right track it has to be tailored to the community but when you look at these the way they're designed is high level you, every community in here could interpret every one of those differently and still have an impact on it so that's the message I think and you're on it okay. sorry but thanks oh, great. all right any other comments that you'd like to add to staff at this time? Staff, do you have any questions at this time? No, sir, it is tremendous. Thank you all very much. Seeing that, there being no other business before the board at this time. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Ooh. What? We got another item. <laughs> <laughs> Darn, I thought we was getting out. <laughs> all right, Mr. Rex, go ahead. All righty, so agenda attachment C in your packet, agenda item number six. Is further discussion on the on the tip regional regional share policy items. Um, so uh, Steve Cook and I are going to tag team here a little bit on this. I'm just going to give a couple quick slides here, just as some background on this model, because I know there's some new people that come in all the time, and uh, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. But you know, there's really two models out there, right? There's the current, there's a, a centralized model and there's a decentralized model. And that's basically it. And we interviewed probably, I don't know, 30 MPOs you know, around the country to try to get the feel for how they allocate their monies. Um, by far and away, the, the, the majority of, of those around the country, they use a more centralized model like we currently do now. Um, there are those that use a, a regional, sub-regional model, um, most notably Seattle and Chicago to some extent. But really, Seattle's model is the one that we've used as kind of our, kind of our template um, and how we developed out this, uh, th this proposal for you all. Um, so just keep that in mind, because I have a few slides on the, on the end that talks about uh, Puget Sound, Sound Regional Council's process. So the dual models we know, um, is uh, basically there's you know there's two pots and before we do a call for projects we have a this set aside program and you guys took action on our proposed set asides um, at your last board meeting thank you very much and this other commitment side so the other commitments as you'll see in, in future slides and and in the allocation slide uh, for to the subregions that other commitments is really wrapped up in the regional share so we really what well, in in those other commitments the projects that we have currently are there's some fast-track investments first and, and um, second commitments associated with that through past tips that um, we're finally rolling off the books now let's say as well as uh, central 70 project we committed to 50 million dollars on to that project 25 in the current tip and 25 in the in the next tip so those will be part of that regional uh, uh, regional share pot, and then the sub-regional share pot. So um, this is certainly time, timely. Uh, you know, as as we've discussed, we, you know, the, the necessity to establish these TIP focus areas, and this became um, it was a recommendation of the of the TIP policy work group and the white papers that we wrote. We believe it is the responsibility of the board to establish those. It's all about you know we have X amount of money over a four year period. What is it we would like to do with that for, for um, that, that pot of money to uh, make life better in this region? And um, some of the discussion we had today, obviously, will help us in, in uh, shaping criteria for you all and the set aside as I mentioned earlier. So the regional share projects, well, what, what we're considering regional share, and we'll, have, we'll really flush this out here in a minute, but it's projects that have a, a significant regional benefit. And um, we've, uh, as part of the TIP policy work group, we provided you all with a recommendation on what we believe that is. And it's primarily, you know, uh, the eligibility for projects are those that are on the kind of the higher level facilities within our region, whether that be on our roadway system, referring to primarily limited access facilities, 
or you know freeways or um, on the, uh, the transit network, kind of the fixed fixed routes or rapid transit uh, uh, system within our region, and uh, the bicycle pedestrian community really more on the more regional corridors within our region. And we really hope that we can simplify the application process, because as we all know last time, my word, that was something else. I know, I know why, it was my first tip process, as many of you know, and I had to read that thing three times before I could figure out what was going on. But it, it was, but you know, I, with that said, I do believe ultimately we selected some pretty darn good projects in that, as well as spatially they look good, as far as the equity amongst modes as well, I think was, was very good. So the sub-regional share, so once the regional sh uh, share projects, the call for projects is done, um, then uh, the monies, it's however much you decide that should go in the sub-regional pot will be proportionally allocated to a predefined geography. And we've defined that geography as counties. And that is similar to what they've done in Seattle as well. And it, quite frankly, it just makes the most sense. Um, and you know, one of the recommendations of the TIP policy work group is that that sub-regional share, we believe, needs to be meaningful. Um, I'll let you guys define later on what meaningful is, but uh, you know, we, in order for them to actually go through that process, that administrative process, it needs to be meaningful enough for, uh, for them to take that on. And um, we also are in agreement, the TIP policy work group, that the, um, the how the money should be proportionally targeted to the to each subregion should be based on a combination of population employment and person miles traveled, um, and this is very similar to how we've uh, well it is almost exactly how we distributed the the geographic equity last time right close yeah it's it's, it's simplified simp is more simplified probably than what we did last time but it's quite frankly. Any combination of that weighted any different way, it really made very little difference. Um, so the TIP policy group, work group felt comfortable in a combination of those three, weighted equally. So let's talk about the governance real quick. Um, you know, so in the sub-regional form, um, each sub-regional form, they will, um, are, will be required to invite every community within their sub-regional form, whether they're a Dr. Cog member or not. Um, we cannot discriminate against communities that are not voluntarily part of Dr. Cog. So, um, so any community that uh, is within, say, Adams County, that are, I don't know if there are any within Adams County that are not members of Dr. Cog, thank you all very much, um, that um, they, they would have to receive a solicitation asking them to participate. They may choose not to, but they would at least have to uh, provide them with that option. And we would require that documentation that you did so. Um, and so every community would be invited to participate. Um, and they would help you in drafting, um, you know, coming up, finalizing your criteria, as well as the selection of projects for recommendation back to the full board. It is also suggested that CDOT and RTD be non-voting members on, the, on, those, on those committees. Um, and, but, um, but again, ultimately, that's up to the decision of the sub-regions. But that, that seems to make a lot of sense, because quite frankly, you know, a lot of the roadways, well, it's certainly some of the most congested roadways within the region are on state highway facilities. And um, on, on the board's role, and I think this is obviously very important, um, and it's something that, um, that Director Odoricio and others have mentioned that, you know, we, this process is such that it, it, everything flows back to the board to make an ultimate decision. Subregions do not have the autonomy to, don't have autonomy to make their own selection on projects. Ultimately, the board, a collection of regional leaders, has that authority, and it is and <coughs> up, and is on you all to make that determination on making sure that those projects or portfolio of projects, as Director Sinatic mentions, um, and I think makes a lot of sense, are consistent with MetroVision, the Regional Transportation Plan, and the focus areas. And, I, and as a result of that, you know, I really think that the process seems, you know, re it makes sense. You can see, you can't really see the arrows here, but everything flows back to the final project selection and decision is with the board. Doug, yes, quite, sir. question. Yes. Um, with regard the sub-regions, we have counties for which there are portions of counties that are not in the region. Um, are those also required to be invited and are they participating? 
Now, when you say counties not within the region, do you mean you mean that there there's some some so the some party. entities that are half in one subregion, half in another, or no? Take, so, take, so like take Eastern Arapahoe County, for uh, or Weld County, and, um, no, where, where there's a where there's a portion of that that is within the region, and some jurisdictions within the region have chosen to participate, uh, but there is. Uh, it, Take Weld as the example. There's a big part of Weld County that's not right. in the region. Right. Um, the answer is no. It, it's all project driven, right? So, so pro the money has to be spent within this geographic boundary, which is the, the MPO boundary, right? Right. Um, so, for example, like Clear Creek and Gilpin County right now are not part of that MPO process. They're part of the Dr. Cog larger process, and we do transportation planning for them, but they're not part of the allocation of monies, the distribution of monies. So, for example, so, so Well County, uh, um, as, you, as you mentioned, only projects within the boundary, Southwest Weld, that are within that boundary are eligible. So they would be invited, quite frankly, Southwest Weld would have their own pot of money because they would be a separate subregion. But I think to clarify Director Sinek's question, the communities that are not within the Dr. Cog boundaries would not be a part of the county? Correct. Yeah, that's... Yeah, like, like Steve just said, Greeley, for example, right. would not be. Could we, could we clarify, but Weld County, which doesn't sit at this table, would oversee that conversation? Well, they're, they're, they're a dues-paying member of the MPO. But they don't sit at the table, but they would still run the sub-regional allocation for those. Yeah, as currently proposed, yes. How interesting. Now, now they sit on, they sit on the, our Transportation Advisory Committee, but they have, not, they have chosen not to participate at the board level. Right, Connie? Yes, that's correct. Okay, hang, hang on. I mean, the communities within Well County, um, yeah, I, mean, I think that's an important point. The state just raised. The communities within Well County, within Southwest Weld, they, they participate at the table, the Dr. Cup, but the county, the incorporate, yeah, the unincorporated county government does not. Okay. So, I, hang, hang on, I got sorry. about two more ahead of you. Ashley, go. Thank you. Could you clarify um, the process, and I apologize if you've done this, um, for communities that are in multiple counties? So, for example, are you going to sort of redraw the counties since it's county little c and put people in one pool so they're in one subregion and their jobs and employment go with them, or is there some other approach? Um, no, the, the way it's proposed, I mean, it's all project-driven, right? So, so like, for example, so, so Westminster, that's, that's a member of two, maybe three counties, right? Three? Two? Yeah. Um, Chairman Axon, Etchison said it was two. Yeah, Adams and Jefferson. Um, Aurora's three. Yeah, definitely so. So, so they will be invited to serve on both sub-regional forums. Now, the projects they submit to each sub-regional forum would be specific to the county boundary that they're in. And so the jobs and population are counted by county? Correct. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, we have up next. Ashley, you're done. So Shakti, right? Um, I was just confused. I think Elise said something about the county runs it, or and what does that mean? Yeah, let me clarify that. I, you know, I think when we talk about counties, the subregional forums being the county, it's county small c. It's not county the government, government entity. Um, the, the once the subregional forums, once they come together, once the invites are out, and you guys meet the first time, you all will decide a chairperson from that group to basically, you know, to to run, you know, to do whatever, to to run the meetings, um, and who handles the administration of that will be will be a decision of that subregional forum. You might decide it might be some community within the subregion, or it might be the county. It's up to you all. But the money does not flow to the county. Thank government. you. I, and then um, in terms of the breakdown between of the funds between counties, you're just looking at the part of the county that's in the region. Correct. Mr. Flynn. Thank you. Um, and maybe I missed this, but did the working group uh, discuss what would happen if the board, the ultimate decision maker, uh, turned down a subregional project, what happens to that allocation? Does it go back to the subregion for reallocation to some other uh, project? And 
Okay. Yeah, it, it, it does. I, I mean, Director Flynn, I mean, theoretically, that, that's what happens. I mean, we haven't, we haven't flushed that out in our policy document yet, but I think that would be my recommendation to the TIP Policy Work Group, that that money still stays with that subregion. Mm -hmm. They would just have to come up with another project that you all collectively feel more comfortable with. Okay. Did the work group uh, discuss that? We've had some maybe cursory discussions about it, but we're not far enough along in okay. uh, those discussions yet. Go ahead, Deborah. Um, so I was wondering what happens if there's a project that goes across two subregions? Then does that make it regional, or does that mean it's a, do the two subregions have to agree? And then the other thing is, um, could you discuss under this model what the governance is for the region? Because I didn't see that on the slide. Well, uh, to answer your first question, I mean theoretically it could be both, right? I mean depending on the the in, the size of the project we're talking about. If it's on an interstate facility, for example, it would be a regional project. If it's a, you know, what is deemed to be eligible only at the sub-regional level, um, I, would, I would, first of all, I would say that, that those projects would be looked upon highly, those that cross uh, regional sub-regional shear boundaries. Um, and I think we would even probably even encourage that as part of, you know, some statement within the document. But yeah, I mean, those, those projects can be submitted. I mean, I think that's, that's part of what we liked about this, this concept, is that there's an opportunity there for collaboration, not only within the subregion, but also among subregions. Sub Any other questions? Oh, oh the, the last part of my question. On, uh, on the governance of the regional? Yeah, so um, that, that's something we'll probably have a larger discussion about at some date, but um, there's really two options with regards to the evaluation of projects that come in. Um, whether the full board wants to vet those projects as, as a full board or if they want to establish a subgroup of the board to do that initial vetting and then provide those recommendations back to the full board. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's really, again, that's up to you all how involved you want to be in that. But those, those are the two options that I see. Any other questions? Anthony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually just have a, a quick comment. I, I wanted to thank uh, all of the members for taking time to address my many, many questions over the board retreat weekend. I was basically a, a vocal skeptic about the regional versus sub-regional. And part of that, frankly, was due to my own ignorance about the infrastructure and process that we were putting in place around this. So I just want to let everybody know that I am supportive now of the regional and sub-regional. However, I have open questions, and I look forward to discussing those open questions. So the criteria that Director Svananik mentioned earlier, I'm very interested to see what the criteria will be that governs both the regional and sub-regional pots, because I think there should be some continuity there. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to see what that back and forth looks like for approval. And I'm also very interested, of course, in the split. Um, I, I still think that the current split that's being proposed is aggressive for a, a new program that we're kind of rolling out uh, and this is a bit of an experimental phase. But I did want to make sure that I was clear with everyone that I appreciated so much your time and that I'm back now off the fence on the other side with you, but want to work through those details. Thank you. I get no, I, thank you. Okay, and I just have a quick comment. I do, at least brought it up at the Weld County. I think we just, can you just iron that out? Because I'm not sure the peanut butter spread works. I, just my opinion, I'm not sure why a county would then govern over. Because when we're looking at IGAs, no, the, I, I shouldn't say govern over, yeah. but when you say counties, I, I, we're looking at IGAs. At least we have some IGAs already started on this. I don't know how many communities have started that. Um, but I would assume it would be whatever collective community in Weld County, whatever they want to call themselves, right. will be the ones to. Yep. Okay. Yep, that's true. Okay. Subweld. Sub yeah. Rita. So I've been trying to understand if Boulder County communities could ever submit a regional project based on this definition, and it looks like we can't. So, and, it, you know, because of the only thing it looks like we could submit is if we were doing rapid transit system guideway facilities and stations or the bikeway, because it's long 36. But 36 is basically done. So we're kind of out if you leave this definition here, and I don't like that. You know, I think we should be able to, 
if, you know, if Ashley and I have a project that will help our communities in Boulder County and other communities within Boulder County, I want to make sure that I can compete for or submit projects for the regional pro money mm -hmm. or otherwise we need to put more money into sub-regional because right now I can't see where I could actually submit a project that would be considered regional. Mm -hmm. I think the proposal is that the subregion would have more money right now. I mean, we haven't got to that point. We haven't yet, gotten to that point, but given but, yeah. what I'm seeing here is you've just thrown us out and we can't even compete at a regional level in Boulder County. Assuming you're going after regional projects, right? I'm just saying that for regional money, I can't yeah. compete for that. I might have a project that fits all of the focus areas precisely, but I can't. And when you do the call for regional projects, it won't fit into the requirement that it's long 36, because 36 is done. Right. I mean, I, I will say that, you know, again, this is a recommendation of the TIP Policy Work Group. I mean, and, and I think what we had hoped to accomplish with this is that, you know, we wanted to, we want the regional pot monies to go to projects that are deemed to be regionally, regionally significant, right? It moves the greatest amount of people. I don't that, like using that, word that to me should be the definition then rather than particular highways. Well, but we had to define we had to define eligibility of that project, right? Uh, I'm so, just saying that it precludes the uh, opportunity to compete for some of those funds. I mean, there possibly, I'm not saying it, you know, I'm not right, saying right. it's it will it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that it yeah. There, all this discussion about regional, I can't even compete for regional money. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good, it's good, it's a good segue into the next section that we're going to talk about here in a second. Thank you. Yeah. Oops. Um, so I'm just kind of checking in on this. What I heard at the board workshop is that um, there is communication with. The, with Seattle and primarily, but other places that, that have at least some experience with this, and I'm assuming that, and I would like confirmation that, um, with these open questions, I mean, we have a lot of questions, we have a lot of open questions that um, you, would, you would be looking to, um, the experience of, of people that have been doing this and helping us understand what not, not so much what their advice is, but what their experience is. Sure. Does that make sense? No, definitely. So. Because I feel like we need some grounding here. Right. <laughs> no, so very good. No, okay. I, I, I I agree with that. And and you know, quite frankly, I I'll throw it out there. I mean, if it helps, you know, maybe we can even get them on a call or invite them in or something like that. If that that helps sometime down the down the road. Um, I will say we've been in constant contact. I'm sure they got us on they they got us on caller ID and. They let it go to voicemail at this point, but um, but they've been they quite frank they've been very welcome. I mean, I, you know, Todd talks to them all the time. But not only at the staff level, we've reached out to 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 communities as well that have participated in this process. Specifically, we actually have one person in our region now that that took part of this in this uh, process back in Seattle, and he's the he's the new city manager at at Littleton, and I've had a couple couple meetings with him to, to talk about this and. So do you understand what I mean by we need some some grounding here? Sure, I do. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Mr. Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I mean, I, I'd like to reinforce what Rita said because uh, we're in Castle Rock, we're kind of in the same boat. We straddle I-25, yet um, is some of our needs that would even be associated with I-25 may not truly be regional across the entire region. But we do have needs that connect us to Parker that, you know, at a sub-regional level, you know, we've got 85 coming out of the north end of town that, you know, really provides connectivity to the western half of our county. And so, um, yeah, I mean, e even us on I-25, I still say we have a lot of needs that are actually probably more sub-regional in nature. So the idea of making sure we do weight the subregions uh, appropriately so that true projects can be done that are going to make, um, have an effect, quite frankly. I mean, I, I definitely speak in favor of that idea um, and probably selfishly, the way you did. <laughs> <laughs> just, well, I'm, it wasn't selfish, it was just 
trying to understand if we are competing for projects that get us the biggest bang for our buck, then some of those might be smaller regional, but they're very regional impacting, you know, not just sub-regional impacting. Mr. Chairman, I, I think it might help if, um, if Steve, I'm going to ask Steve Cook coming up here in a minute to just go through these next slides because you asked for some additional information um, at the last meeting that we're, we provided to you all and I'd like for Steve just to walk you through those, those, uh, those, that information that you asked for for discussion. All right, so let me, uh, what I show is Ms. Jones, Mr. Dyack, Mr. Brockett, and Ms. Stoltzman. Can you guys hang on for just a minute and let's get through this and then we'll come back to you. That was my comment. We, people want to have that discussion, so let, why don't we finish the present? All right, thank you. So I am Steve Cook with the Transportation Planning and Operations section. And what we're going to be talking about here is, I'm glad this slide was up here previously, is the middle box. We're talking about the regional share here. So we've had a lot of talk here today about sub-region, region. At the moment, we're just going to be talking about the uh, the regional share, and I'm going to bring up the this. Okay, how far down do I got to go? All right. This was presented to you initially at uh, last month's meeting, and it was a recommendation from the TIP policy work group. And as Doug mentioned, you asked us to bring back. Uh, some further information, and probably most importantly, some clearer maps. A lot of the maps that we had in the last rendition of this had extra information on there that really wasn't needed. Um, so we got a little more specificity to uh, what will be eligible on the maps. So this table, uh, which was in the last one, is pretty much the same other than some of the uh, ID numbers and figure numbers. So I think it will be good if we kind of get into the maps maybe go through them sort of quickly and then come back and ask questions. But I don't want to prohibit any, you know, technical questions or anything. I don't want to do that by any means. Um, the first map on here, and I'm going to go into our, where's our uh, control minus, is under the subject of uh, rapid transit types of projects. And there's basically three different types of facilities that were in your attachment. And these are the, it got confusing, we had a lot of maps and things here. These are the uh, maps, and this was figure A, within your attachment to. We apologize for the quantity of uh, maps and attachments in this memo, but there was a lot, a lot to cover. So the first subject area is the uh, rapid transit type uh, projects and locations that would be eligible. And the types that we have on here are the uh, rail system, bus HOV lanes, and what's noted on here are the uh, express or managed lanes if there's specific transit physical components to them. So even uh, like the North I-25 section uh, in Thornton, there's the transit underpass and types of specific facilities that kind of enhance that uh, managed lane there uh, for transit service and likewise along US 36. So that's the geography of eligibility and I want to stress the types of projects that we're assuming are eligible. It's not only new projects that like, complete sections of these various transit guideways, I'll call them guideways, um, which basically means some type of facility that's specialized for the transit vehicles right out our door here, the bus lanes on Lincoln and Broadway. In our technical world here, that is a type of transit guideway. So there's a physical new projects to complete things, but also operational projects that may improve service, the facility, the operations of that facility. So I don't know if there's anything out there at the moment. So that's part of the flexibility under transit is that if there's a, an operational improvement along any of these, that could be proposed as part of the regional um, pot. So come back to this, get to the page. The second piece, which is the uh, eligible bicycle corridors. And one thing I want to stress with this map and a couple of the others, primarily this one, it's going to be 
These are the maps at the moment, but we'll be going through a plan amendment process over the next six months. So really what it's going to be is if there's any minor amendments to any of these, it's the version of this map as of next, let's call it next March or April, if that's adopted, um, is what will be used. So this is just showing what the current one is. And for this one here, it's what was identified are these geographic corridors for of these bicycle facilities, these significant bicycle facilities, but that the types of projects eligible, once again, could either be completing sections of these that might not exist today, you know, there may be a gap in some of these, or once again, I'll, what we'll call uh, operational or things that significantly improve an existing facility. So if there's a part here where uh, a red line on a road uh, crosses a busy highway, crosses Parker or Colorado, and you want to put in an underpass. It's proposed that that would be eligible. So I think there may be more eligible than, than, than you may think. So it could be either completing sections of these or something that does a significant operational improvement, which would probably also mean a safety improvement in all likelihood. Uh, the next one here, before I get into the roadway eligibility, we're going to do a very, very quick 101, bringing that uh, one that was just up. What we'll be talking about, and so I'm just zooming in here just so we can see those categories there, is uh, a 101 of the types of roadways that are on our regional system because we're going to be recommending the types of projects eligible on our freeways, which primarily are, are not primarily, the, the highways in red. This regional system was approved by the Dr. Cog Board a couple of years ago as part of our 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. And so we have our freeways. Also, our toll authority highways out there that we like, highlighted in yellow, um, but those are public high, highway authorities with their own uh, toll revenue money. The freeways, obviously, those are our busiest highways. Uh, we've got the traffic volumes on our freeways can range from you know, 15,000 or 20,000 cars a day, which is like 30,000 people out in the rural areas to the heart of Denver where we're talking about traffic volumes of 250 to 300,000 vehicles a day, which equates to, you know, three to 400,000 people being carried in those vehicles. So these are our, our obviously our, our highest volume uh, facilities. In gold uh, are our major regional arterials. And you'll see in a minute that we made, it was proposed that those be eligible for the regional pot. And so those are our kind of second tier highways, uh, such as uh, Parker Road, US 85, Longmont Diagonal uh, up in the north, US 85 to the north. And those are our really main regional connecting uh, arterials. You know, there are, are surface roads that have occasional traffic lights, unless you're on Colfax or Colorado, which have dozens and dozens of traffic lights. Um, these roads will have anywhere from 15 to 17,000 uh, vehicles a day, which equates to up to 100,000 people being carried on a, on a roadway like Wadsworth or Colorado Boulevard. Those are really our two busiest uh, surface streets. Mm -hmm. Just is, to make the determination, is it the amount of use that differentiates? Yeah, when those were uh, determined years ago, it's, 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 it's two pieces. It's amount of use. It's kind of their regional connectivity. So if you see some of these, they kind of collect, connect broader areas. Obviously, 285 in, in Jefferson County, as you get further out towards Bailey, places like that, your volumes are pretty low. I know Sunday afternoons coming home, backed up traffic. You, you wouldn't believe what I just said. But generally speaking, it's lower volume compared to a Colorado or a, or a Wadsworth but it's a really important connection, a statewide connection, you know, as a matter of fact, for that, US 85 up north. And it's almost like looking at old fashioned, I'm going back in time to my Rand McNally roadmap collection, which nobody does anymore. My kids are like, what, what's that piece of paper you got there? 
it's like the old maps, what was the book years ago, Blue Highways, you know, it's kind of your tiers of, of highways that you would see on an, on an old uh, uh, road map. So that's the major regional arterials uh, in, in gold. And then in blue, which is the bulk of what you see on our regional roadway system that you approved, are our principal arterials. So that's our other uh, you know, sub-regional connecting roadways, you know, our busier streets within your communities. Uh, you may have traffic on there, you know, probably the lowest volume one is like peak to peak highway up in here. It's probably 3,000 cars a day, which is, might be 3,500 people, you know, compared to some roads on here, university through the city with 40,000 cars. But peak to peak highway is important because it's a key connector um, from a regional standpoint. Um, and these are spread throughout the area, uh, many of them. If you look at this entire system, I don't have the exact number with me, but of our total amount of traffic in a day, probably 75% of it, of our VMT, is on this system here. So this really is, is the bulk. So with that quick little 101-ish there, now I want to go back to our attachment tour we had. The, uh, the listing of uh, types of eligible projects. So on our freeway system, on our freeway system map, which is figure C, two types of projects that would be eligible. If it's a capacity project, now I want to stress the difference that we have in our RT regional transportation plan lingo between a capacity project and an operational project. A capacity project basically is if it's widening of a road of more than a mile in length it might be a new road we don't have too many of those at the moment but it's mainly widening projects if you're widening more than a mile on a freeway that is designated as a capacity project and by federal law that has to be pre-identified in our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan so at the moment in our fiscally constrained plan, it's really just these segments with the blue markings that are currently eligible, that would be eligible for a capacity project in the regional pot. What we have uh, mentioned in previous meetings is that operational projects that may be proposed can be anywhere on the freeway system. So an operational project is more like a bottleneck point if you're just extending a acceleration lane a little bit or ex extending a lane, an auxiliary lane between two uh, uh, interchange ramps, there are types of operational projects. They're more the spot improvements, less than a mile. Those are eligible. Those would be eligible under the current uh, proposal anywhere on uh, the red freeway system here. Um, what's the next map? That's the freeways. Another thing that we show are uh, managed lanes, uh, the, of which the blue are on freeways and the greens are some of our arterials. These managed lane projects have to be identified in our regional transportation plan because they're more than a mile long. So these are all identified uh, in, in the plan. Um, the next element that's in was in the attachment that was presented initially last month is railroad grade separations. And what was proposed through the work group was that uh, any uh, bridge or tunnel, I guess, uh, where there's currently a railroad crossing of any facility on our regional system, which really is the principal arterials and the major regional arterials. I don't think we have any rail crossings of freeways uh, uh, in our area. I, I, I hope not, and I, I, I can't think of any. So this would be something like in Arvada several years ago, the Grandview Wadsworth uh, rail crossing would be a type. And those are identified on this map in the, uh, the red, kind of look like orange up here, but in the red dots, I think the red uh, triangles also. So those would be eligible if if a, a sponsor had a project for that. At the last work session, it was, there we go, it was recommended that the major regional arterials, that we bring the information back to consider making the major regional arterials eligible for the regional pot. 
uh, regional share. So if you remember, originally the TIP work group said anything on the freeways should be eligible for uh, regional share funds. It was suggested by this group, well, shouldn't we consider the major regional arterials, which are our uh, streets and highways that were in gold? And so we went back and looked, and we brought these maps to you that are in the attachment of one, two, three, four, basically five or, I think there's five or six locations in our current fiscally constrained plan that would be eligible for capacity projects. So we got a couple on 285, US 85, um, the Colfax and uh, Diagonal, which essentially are the managed lanes. Those would be eligible if you wanted to include major regional arterials for capacity project. If you, if you wanted to do an operational project, it could be anywhere on this gold, and I guess the blue overwrote the gold, anywhere on this gold system. If there was a intersection project, that's a type of operational project. If you add turn lanes at an intersection, maybe to help reduce uh, crashes. And I think, oh, there was, then one other thing that is in, when you asked us to come back with information on the major regional arterials, um, last month we presented information on the past couple of tips of the projects that we funded in the last few years about what share, if we, if we use the current freeway eligibility, remember last month, uh, I'll put the two, we did two, we did two different sets of tips. And so last month we presented to you that you took the freeways that, uh, and, and bicycle system projects were about 35 and 22, you average well, about 29% of the projects in the last two tips were in that freeway and also the bicycle, but primarily the freeway system. When we include the major regional arterial and look at the projects of the last two tips, it goes up to those numbers in red which are like 40% and 50, you put those together, it's about 45% of the last two tips would be freeway projects, MRAs, and those couple of bicycle projects, which from a monetary standpoint were pretty small. Um, I guess we we're kind of uh, surprised by our memory that there's actually been quite a few uh, major regional arterial projects uh, in the last couple of tips on uh, Wadsworth, Foothills Parkway, US 85, so actually quite a few uh, in the last couple. So with that, if we want to go back to any maps or if you have any uh, specific questions. Before we go back, we have approximately 20 minutes left and we will be adjourning at 6 because P&E is going to start meeting at 6. So we've got about 20 minutes left. And I'm going to go back to the list. Ms. Jones, you're up first. Well, I didn't have uh, a question, but more a comment than uh, I, I, at the last meeting, a number of us talked about adding major regional arterials to basically expand the opportunity for folks at this table to, to suggest a regional project under the theory that regional projects, bigger, bigger return for the region and really cross-jurisdictional. Um, and it would appear that the data that you provide is would suggest that if we did expand the definition, we might also want to expand the amount of money in the regional pot to be somewhat more to accommodate that increased demand. And I guess that's something I think that we should take a look at. Mr. Dyack. Uh, yeah, I was uh, raising my hand for a different uh, reason, but um, uh, it, with with the new information, um, I'm narrower the better, bigger the better. Um, so I mean, to me, the arterial good information, but um, I would I would prefer to to limit um, limit the scope of of regional. Um, and uh, to me, if if this has gone through the uh, the tip work group and, and they've all blessed that, is that correct, director? Bless what? Well, the um, you know the 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 the, uh, the crossings, the uh, railroad crossings. Oh yeah, all that. Okay. Yeah, that was in their original tip policy work group proposal. The only thing where they differ is the inclusion of the uh, major regional arterials. Okay. Is being, their their recommendation is still their recommendation, and okay. that and that 
does not include the MRAs. And then in, in terms of uh, trails, um, I mean, to me, I, I, I guess, you know, for me, I would, I would like to get some more information in terms of characteristics or criteria as to, um, you know, I, I don't think a, a $1 million trail gap is, is regional. Um, so I would need more information on that and, um, you know, still uh, a Pena Boulevard airport facility, I, I don't think it's a regional road. Mr. Brockett. Yes, I was going to address these issues in response to Director Dozal's comments because I think without the major regional arterials, uh, many communities I think will be in superior situation, which is that there's no projects that they can propose because uh, it really is a pretty limited set other than maybe the railroad crossings. Um, so I, I think, uh, but those major regional arterials I think absolutely do provide a regional function. So I'd really love to see those included. I also appreciate the inclusion of the operational projects as an opportunity. That's the kind of thing that we focus on in the, in the city of Boulder, and I think it's beneficial to the whole region when we uh, treat, deal with those bottlenecks uh, and not just focus on adding lanes. So I, I like this proposal. Ms. Dolson. Thank you very much. So early in the presentation, Director uh, Rex uh, was talking about the previous commitments, the fast tracks and the I-70 previous commitments, that they would be part of the regional pool. And I would instead favor that those are set aside. I didn't realize that uh, in the past. I think those should be, those are things we've committed to. I think they should be off the top, similar to other commitments and not part of either pool. Um, that's just a minor point. Um, just sort of for the larger picture, I am, I, Louisville and myself are supportive of more funding going to a regional pool. When I heard different people talking about it, someone said these are the areas that move the greatest amount of people. These are the projects that have the greatest impact on the citizens. I mean, these are the kind of words I heard people saying. And uh, when we talked about it as a community, it's like this is the Denver Regional Council of Governments. We should be trying to work on projects that impact the region in the most significant way that we possibly can. So I, I think we need to uh, make sure that we have a substantial amount of funding go to the regional pool and then I'm also supportive of opening it up and if you have a project that can compete and can score well um, and you know then even Louisville or Superior could demonstrate yeah this is going to have this kind of VMT reduction this is going to have this kind of impact on life and we could compete against a Denver if we can prove it if we can show that it has the same kind of impact if we can't so be it um, I, I still think the sub-regional share is an important piece that can augment the regional collaboration, uh, but I think that we need to make sure that we don't take away from what I see as our critical charge as a group. Mr. Partridge. I'm looking at the, the standalone. And so as we have it, standalone projects aren't considered regional for Dr. Cog. And we really look at E-470 and maybe Northwest Parkway too. Those are standalone. But basically, those are your most perfect form of P3. So my question is, on a project that has, so is, is that correct, as I say, so P3s basically are not considered. If it's a full P3 project, it would not be considered, it would be considered standalone. It would not fall under our credit, any of our uh, funding categories. A full well, P3 project. Well, I think it would. It could. It could be. For example, a US 36 uh, was was a was a P3. But it wasn't fully P3. What's full? It's fully public private partnership. Right. So you had a private corporation being as part of the funding mechanism. Yeah, we do. Right. It wasn't fully P3 though, right? So maybe it's an authority versus. Yeah. I, I, P3? I, I think I, that's. Go ahead. Ms. That's right. What Devin Smith, mentioned. Go ahead. Your comment. Deborah? I think there might be a distinction between what's a, an authority. Yeah. So E-470, Northwest Parkway are authorities that have a different funding and different um, legislation than US, uh, US 36, which is not an authority. Does that help? Right. Uh, yes. I get the difference, but what I'm trying to do, basically, they are P3 projects. Director yes, Partridge, I, I, if, if I may, Go ahead. I, I, th I think the distinction, you know, amongst the authorities that, that Deb suggests are like E-470 and, and others, is that we've always considered those in our planning process to be locally funded projects because they have their, their source of revenue for, for 
their operation and maintenance and construction of projects. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, right, Steve? I mean, that, so, so they've never been eligible for federal or state monies as part of our long-range transportation planning, financial planning purposes. Right. I fully understand that. But the but big thing is they are major regional arterials. So to take it out of the category is one of the challenges. But what I'm getting to is that when you have, because those are locally funded or privately funded, you can almost put it that way. Well, that's what a P3 is. So have you, how do we handle projects that have a portion of P3 or that are all fully P3? Well, they've never, the projects that you, that you mentioned, I mean, those types of projects have never been eligible as part of our planning process, our funding process. It just hasn't been eligible. But US 36 had partial P3. Right, but that also has partial P3. Yeah, but it's on a public facility. And had significant state and federal money associated with, yeah. That's, that's the, I think part of that is that GIS 36 is a state highway. So because of the federal and the state dollars that are included in it, it is a P3, but it is not an authority because we get federal funds and we get state funds and we get local matching funds out of every community that was along the corridor. Yeah, there's, I think there's more thought that needs to go into that. I think there's, a, there's an odd complexity there. I think we just have to be aware. I don't have it figured out, but I think we have to ask that question. So I think it probably is something to take to the tip to figure that out because that, cause there is that difference when it's an authority because, first of all, they don't receive any federal funding. You know, they're not under federal guidelines. That's another thing. So I see where it's going, but I think we have to ask that question to make sure maybe there's another uh, uh, factor in there that we want to, that we need to be aware of. Okay, I've got about three more people that have asked to speak, and we're going to be running pretty close to out of time. So if there's anyone else that wants anything, we want to get these three out of the way first. We may not finish this conversation tonight. That's okay. If it doesn't, it doesn't, because we need to make sure that what we're going to recommend to the board has the approval and the recommendation of this body because you're recommending th this is primarily the work group that's going to take it to the final board decision. I've got uh, Mr. Odoricio, Ms. Shakti, and then Ms. Jones. Steve? I, uh, I, just a clarification. So it, if we don't expand the definition to include these arterials, they can still be addressed at the subregion, correct? correct? Correct. So I guess what I'm looking at is instead of expanding the definition of the regional, why don't we just keep it broad and have those addressed at the subregion and make sure that the ratios are covered enough so we can address that. So I can address federal, someone else can address Wadsworth, someone else can address 120th or 104th, or together we can address like Highway 7 that will go across Adams, Boulder, Roof. I mean, like, the way I look at it is I like the idea of doing it subregionally, and I don't see a need for us to expand the definition to include arterials when that's going to better be addressed locally. Um, then, then we don't have, you know, like the folks from Superior worried about uh, not being eligible. They'll be able to make more of those decisions at the sub-regional level to address some of those um, sub-regional issues. I'm hurrying up. Sorry, Phil. No, that was an agreement. Oh. I thought it meant like hurry the hell up. That, my <laughs> wife does that to me when she's like, come on. That, that would have been this. <laughs> yeah. This is the All right. Thank you. Talk to you. I think that the conversation about the funding breakdown can be separate from the conversation about um, which roads to include for regional projects. Um, it makes sense to me to include the, um, um, I don't remember the word, but the Major light yellow ones. <laughs> um, to expand the definition because those are in fact roads that have a regional impact and maybe there's some projects that could really compare well. Anybody applying to them for them will see the amount of money there is and understand that there's competition based on how well you're addressing regional needs, but I don't see what the disadvantage of including them is. Ms. Jones. Um, I'm of the mind, and I, th I think I'm echoing Director Stolzman's comments about that 
you know, the the most important thing that Dr. Cog is act, does is to act regionally and to think like a region, and that's the power of this group. And I think that's why some of us are arguing to have the opportunities to suggest regional projects because it really emphasizes that. And as we want to put together a transportation system that makes sense across the region, it seems like it would be enhanced by that. I guess I would offer, if it doesn't sound like we've wrestled this to the ground, if we end up not supporting um, adding major regional arterials and expanding the definition and the opportunity to think regionally and fund regionally, then I guess I want to piggyback on a comment that Doug Rex made. Then we should incentivize at the sub-regional level for sub-regions to look across their borders. And again, Steve and I both have an interest in Highway 7 that crosses our county lines and benefits a number of jurisdictions. There should be an incentive to fund at the sub-regional level projects that are effectively regionally beneficial and cross multiple jurisdictions. So that's something to think about. I also wanted just to clarify for Roger the difference between the tolling authorities that you mentioned and other P3 projects like US 36 is how they were added to the RTP. For example, the Jefferson Parkway was included in the RTP RTP only as a privately funded toll road. And so if you're included in the RTP in that way, you're not eligible to receive federal funds through the TIP, even though you're part of the RTP. So you would have to go back and amend the RTP and change that in order to change how those funding allocations. So the difference isn't that they're, they're a P3, it's that they're a privately funded toll road as it was included and adopted in the RTP. Okay, anyone else? Ms. Smith, Ms. Perkins Smith, myself. Thank you. Um, you know, as a state agency, this is really an MPO issue, but I, I was just thinking of some parallels because we deal with statewide. And oftentimes when we talk about regional, it's not just based on capacity, the roads that are moving the most traffic, it's also based on connectivity. So in some of the roadways you actually have shown under your MRA projects, those are more what I would call regional connectivity, meaning that they go through many, many, many jurisdictions. So if something happened to one of those high capacity things, that is a very important facility. So it's a regional connectivity. So I just want to share that thought, and that comes from like dealing statewide. We have the same issue. So some roadways are very important from a regional connectivity standpoint. We think of them as regional, even though they don't carry as much traffic as the interstate. So just throwing that out there. Mr. Sinanik. Just a, a question on process as we go through this. Um, from my perspective, at least what I've uh, been looking to is that there will be an evaluation of these that will occur from the staff level so that when we start to look at both the sub-regional portfolios as well as the sub-regionals and the regional portfolio, um, those will be come back and saying, hey, we've come close to optimizing our dollars as far as uh, against our focus areas and as, as well against the Metro Vision objectives uh, that are related to transportation. And um, to some extent, whether something's in MRA uh, and included in regional requests or not, to, to me, um, I'd love to see some of those collaborative discussions at that sub-regional level that gives them uh, in to some extent encourages us uh, as we were talking about that incentive uh, to be in a position to collaborate even across sub-regions on some items. And I don't see it as detracting from our regional discussions because we're still going to have that when it comes back to the board. Um, and though we may not be looking at the individual projects within a sub-region, um, being able to be in a position to say our, our sub-region has collaborated with another sub-region and together we actually, uh, and I'll use the word score, score better in our portfolio uh, because we've taken those things into consideration. Is, 
Mr. Rex, do you have anything to wrap up? Well, on, on that, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think what we will provide you, Phil, is the information for you, for you all to feel you have as perfect information as possible to make that make those determinations on regional projects and sub-regional pro projects and or portfolios, right? Um, I, we always thought of ourselves in the regional process as kind operating staff as kind of the kind of the CBO, right, that we would evaluate the applications that we get in to make sure they're legitimate, what they're proposing, and provide those that information back to you all for, for you to be able to evaluate. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it there. I know we're short on time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've all had an opportunity. I know there's been... Can I say one more thing? There? Oh, sure. Now you want I'm to sorry, Herb. <laughs> Chairman, real, real quick on this. Um, if, if there's a few things we didn't get to today, which is fine, um, but I will, if, Steve, if you wouldn't mind just scrolling. Yep. I, I, the reason, I just wanted to make sure you're aware that this is in the packet because it was specifically asked for at the last meeting, and that was um, the inverse of this 70-30 proportional split amongst the, um, you know, this region and subregion, that the, the 70 percent, or sorry, 30 percent regional, 70 percent 70 percent subregional, was what was uh, recommended by the TIP policy work group. Um, it was specifically asked at the last meeting that we also provide that inverse. So I wanted you to know that that was in there. So it's 30, so 70 percent regional, 30 percent sub-regional. So that's in your packet for uh, just, you can peruse that as, as you like. And the, the other portion of this presentation was some additional slides, some information about Puget Sound Regional Council's process. And we can talk about that more next time. We also included a link in the, in the agenda uh, packet itself uh, to the actual policy framework that, that uh, Puget Sound uses. Um, so, because we had some, uh, I, I had some requests at the tip halls, at the, at the workshop specifically about Puget Sound, so I wanted to provide some additional information. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention tonight. Uh, those of you who are here as part of the P&E group, we will readjourn down at Monarch as soon as you can take a quick break and move down there.